And the next item of business is a debate on motion 3393 in the name of Richard Lockhead on UK Shared Prosperity Fund, what this means for Scotland. I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak button now. And I call on Richard Lockhead, Minister, to speak to and to move the motion. Up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. European funding has brought significant investment to the whole of Scotland, from the New Lanark World Heritage Centre to the LEADER programme, which of course delivers economic development in the rural areas, from the Modern Apprenticeship Scheme and projects like Murray's Income Maximisation programme in my own constituency that helps families in need. And the benefits of all these programmes and many others is tangible. But we have always been concerned that the UK Government's Shared Prosperity Fund the promised replacement for EU funds following Brexit would pale in comparison to the benefits of being in the EU. And after seeing the levelling up white paper and pre-launch guidance on this replacement fund, I know that our concerns are justified. It is clear that levelling up means losing out for Scotland. We are set to lose out financially, we are losing out in terms of our devolved authority, and crucially for our people, we are losing the benefits we enjoyed as members of the European Union. It is disappointing that the UK Government's intention is not to truly replace the EU structural funds, a promise they made back in 2017. Instead, they are using this fund to prop up the unambitious, underfunded and strategically vapid levelling up agenda. Indeed, yeah. I am grateful to the Minister for giving way. Can I remind the Chamber how much money the Scottish Government had to repay to EU structural funds due to financial irregularities? Minister. Well, as a member knows, all governments have to deal with decommitment, and that is part of the, the EU funding system. But I will come on to the massive benefits that these funds have delivered for the members' constituency and for the whole of Scotland. But in terms of the levelling up agenda, as the Institute for Fiscal Studies says, the UK Government has chosen its destination with no sense of how it plans to get there. Positioning the Shared Prosperity Fund as a main pillar of its levelling up agenda the key aim of the fund, we are told, is to restore local pride. This broad focus does not compare with the value of tackling regional economic inequalities. With talks of uh, mayors and Renaissance Italy, levelling up bears little relevance to modern Scotland. Now, Scottish ministers. Are you asking to give it up? Yep. Daniel Johnson? Uh, uh, thank you. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear when I stood up. Um, look, uh, in a sense, I, I agree with the Minister. I think that the logic behind these new funds is confused and the metrics are, are unclear in the application process. But there is a point here that we have gross regional inequalities in Scotland, and surely that does need addressed, even if this is not the right way to go about it. Richard Lockett, Minister. Of course we have challenges in terms of regional inequalities in Scotland, and that is why the EU funds were so, so important over many decades, because they helped mitigate and tackle some of uh, these challenges which have been with us for generations. And Scottish ministers set out a clear plan for Scotland's share of the replacement funding back in 2020. Meanwhile, the UK Government have not even set out Scottish investment priorities or informed us of our allocation. When we first learnt of this fund, we set out our asks. We expected to retain the same level of autonomy over allocations governance and policy development. But UK ministers have so far failed to meet these expectations. We also set out a justifiable calculation of £183 million per year being devolved to the Scottish Government. This would provide a comparable replacement for the range of programmes available under the EU at that time. Yeah. For, for taking this intervention, does he believe local government should also play a role in this? And if so, why are not they mentioned in his motion for today's debate? Minister. <coughs> Well, of course, through the regional economic partnerships and other players across uh, Scotland who have been involved in the, uh, setting the priorities for regional funding, of course, local authorities have, have got a say in that. But can I just say that we have concluded, as a Scottish Government, from the UK autumn budget, that Scotland's share is unlikely to be delivered, as promised. Our view is backed by the UK Treasury's committee, who suggests that the fund's maximum £1.5 billion annual budget equates to a 40 per cent a 40 per cent reduction compared with the amount the UK receives from the EU in the current programmes. Whilst well, calculated for the whole of the UK, this does confirm that Scotland will ultimately lose out big time. And despite confirming the overall quantum, ministers can't tell us 
whether this will cover all the various programmes under the EU. And the result is massive uncertainty. For instance, with the rural community-led uh, development work that is previously delivered through the LEADER programme, which many members are familiar with, and that brings much anxiety to those relying on investment uh, to function. In 2019, the UK budget stated that replacement funding would, and I quote, at a minimum match current levels for each nation. In 2021, Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government, Robert Jenrick, went further, stating in Parliament that, and I quote again, at least as much, if not more, funding will go to communities in Scotland than would have been received if we stayed within the EU. But it is clear that the UK Government cannot honour these commitments, and again, Scotland is going to lose out. And through the UK Internal Market Act, the UK Government is encroaching into devolved areas, as was discussed in Parliament just in the last hour or two. They are using Brexit, which Scotland did not vote for, to weaken devolution, which it did vote for. They are undermining Scotland's democratic voice. Scottish Ministers have consistently reminded the UK that we expect to be treated as a full and equal partner in the development of the Shared Prosperity Fund. We retain the belief that Scotland's share of the funding ought to be fully devolved. This will let us tailor it to the needs of Scotland and align with the ambitions set out in the National Strategy for Economic Transformation. By using the Internal Market Act to start spending in devolved areas directly with local governments, the UK Government are sidelining the Scottish Government and the wider ecosystem we have in Scotland of all our agencies and regional players. They are missing out on the breadth and depth of knowledge we have of our own economy, and Scotland is losing out on our devolved autonomy. It is absurd to claim that reducing the role of the Scottish Government and working directly with our local authorities is real devolution in action. Real devolution is what the people of Scotland voted for back in 1997, when they chose to establish this Parliament, a Parliament which on numerous occasions has agreed that the way in which the UK Government is implementing this policy is completely inconsistent with devolution and democracy in Scotland. I met with the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Levelling Up, Mr O'Brien, and Under Secretary of State for Scotland, Mr Stewart, last week. I emphasised the rightful authority of this Government in leading on this fund. They agreed to set out in writing how they see our role, offering some reassurance it will not be as peripheral advisers. I await that letter and to see whether these assurances have any truth. But as I draw to a conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, as the, replacement, uh, moves further, as the replacement funding moves further away from the positive aims of the EU funding we did have in Scotland, delivered by the Scottish Government for nearly five decades, we see that it is an example of how much Scotland will lose in the benefits of EU membership. EU funding that supported projects like the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney, which contributed over £300 million to the UK economy and supported over 200 jobs. So I do call upon the, government, uh, the, so the UK Government to um, listen to Scotland's uh, plea for the promises to be delivered, and I call on this Parliament to agree that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund falls far short of what we were promised and fails to offer the level of autonomy and influence the Scottish Government experienced under the EU. We must have a full and equal role in determining how these funds are used. We must have confirmation that Scotland's allocation of this fund matches our lost EU funding. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Liz Smith to speak to and to move Amendment 3393.1. Up to six minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I move the amendment in my name? Uh, may I begin by uh, reiterating the belief on these benches that in the post-Brexit era, every effort must be made by the UK Government to ensure that there is absolutely no loss of equivalent funding to the devolved nations, loss of money that we would have had had we still been part of the EU. Whether it is via the Community Renewal Fund, the Levelling Up Fund or the Shared Pr Prosperity Fund, it is absolutely vital that there is at least equivalent funding for the loss of the EU's structural funds. In other words, and to adopt one of the principles of the Smith Commission, there must be no detriment. For me, three things matter in this whole debate. Firstly, the absolute best interests of Scotland, most especially in terms of improving our economic performance. Secondly, that our local authorities and our local communities, which for such a long time have asked for more autonomy, feel more empowered. And thirdly, that there is a joined-up approach between Westminster, Scottish Government and local authorities. Last week, the Finance and Constitution Committee took evidence for the Secretary of State for levelling up housing and communities, Michael Gove, and that was an important session 
during which members could address their understandable concerns about the details of replacement funding. And earlier this afternoon, during the debate on the internal market, we had an opportunity to debate more of these issues. And we know that that internal market confers a right on Westminster to spend money in the aspects of the UK for which it does not have devolved competence, for example, on infrastructure projects such as roads or railways. The aim is to provide additional investment, but there are some, and I hear them from the benches on my right, that this is an all-out attack on devolution, a power grab of unlimited proportion and something which Scotland can well do without. Yes, of course. Daniel Johnson. I am very grateful to Liz Smith for, for giving way. Uh, and, uh, you know, while I acknowledge what she is saying here, she pursued a very interesting line of question when Mr Gove was before committee about coordination. And indeed, that we have some very clear goals set out uh, in places such as the National Performance Framework. And, and therefore, there is a risk that this uh, somehow, I think, uh, is out of alignment with some of those goals and that there is a need for coordination. Now, I was just wondering if she would reflect upon that and what her thoughts are about improving the coordination of these funds. Ms. Smith. Well, I actually think there are two points there, uh, Mr. Johnson. The first is about the, co the cooperation, because that is absolutely essential, um, that there is proper um, cooperation. And I think Mr. Gove um, gave full commitment that if any of us feel that that cooperation is not happening, then he will address that ASAP. And uh, the Cabinet Secretary has uh, just referred to the fact that he's had engagement with uh, some of the, the Scottish Office Ministers who are saying exactly the same thing. The second issue, which I think is relevant too, is about the statistical evidence uh, that relates to the performance uh, framework and how the Scottish Government's um, ambitions articulate with those of the UK government. I think that's a very important issue and uh, as I say that's one thing that uh, both Mr Johnson and myself were pursuing uh, at the committee. So I think it is absolutely vital that as we are debating this absolutely crucial issue we are very cognizant of the fact that um, there are devolved responsibilities very clearly set out but there are also uh, the aspects of devolution that goes further down the line to our local government and our local authorities um, who are wanting uh, to have a, a greater say in how that money is spent. And, uh, Mr Lockhead referenced uh, some of the spending that's already happened in his own uh, constituency uh, of Murray, and that's, that's vitally important because I think if we, if we measure out what is happening just now in terms of the levelling up, that there are some really good uh, programmes that are giving that additional money that's on top of anything that would come from uh, Barnet Consequentials that's giving us um, that additional say. So I think that's uh, extremely important. Now, let me deal with just a few of the uh, criticisms uh, that have come, and, and particularly in relation to the comment Mr Lockhead made about what the uh, Treasury Committee and the Welsh Government uh, had said about their concerns over the replacement funds that it isn't the full 183 million uh, that would be Scotland's share. Now, can I acknowledge that there would be some concern uh, about that, Mr Lockhead, um, if it wasn't also the fact that the EU funds are being replaced, not just by the Shared Prosperity Fund, but as time goes on, as the EU funding, which is still taking place in Scotland, but it will diminish over time, that's absolutely correct, but Mr Gove has given a very full commitment that that will be ramped up as that other fund uh, diminishes. And I think that's the key point there, that if at any stage there was any hint that we weren't getting enough money on the same basis uh, as we had had in the EU, then that's something that, uh, as I say, I think would be uh, very fair criticism. Now, the Scottish Government is saying that this is um, an attack on devolution. I, I, I don't accept that. And if I can just reference the fact that in uh, my own region, when it came to the uh, Tay Cities deal, there was excellent cooperation between the Westminster government, the Scottish government, uh, the local authorities, a lot of the, uh, the stakeholders. And um, again, I think that it's, it's, it's about ensuring that our, our local communities who know their areas best have the facility to be able to direct that funding in the ways that can best benefit their own particular uh, economy. Can I just finish on the point, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer? I think there are issues about uh, some of the modelling that is used to decide on uh, how this will be applied, but I do not accept that there is a deliberate undermining of what has to be spent in Scotland. Where I think there is scope for some change 
is on making sure that the data that is used, uh, interrogated by the ONS, applies to both the Scottish and the UK objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Smith. And I'm just trying to recall if the... Thank you, Ms Smith. Uh, and I now call on Paul Sweeney uh, to speak to and to move Amendment 3393.2 up to five minutes, please, Mr Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I move the amendment in the name of my friend, the Member for Edinburgh Southern. Um, today's debate on the UK's Shared Prosperity Fund is long overdue. Uh, and since the Brexit vote occurred in 2016, questions have been frequently asked about what would replace the EU structural funds. And despite repeated assurances that a replacement would appear, I think many of us were sceptical whether it ever would. So let's start on a point of consensus and welcome the fact that the detail has finally appeared. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, I feel, fear that is where the consensus is going to end, because the reality is that the detail far from matches the rhetoric that we heard on the run-up to those announcements. The rhetoric was that the UK Prosperities Fund would at least match the level of EU funds it is replacing. In fact, the Conservative amendment today states exactly that. The reality is it is 40 per cent less than the EU funds it is replacing. The Treasury Select Committee in the House of Commons have to give way. Ms Smith? I thank the member for giving way. Does he accept that, um, as we stand just now, there is currently some existing EU money in Scotland? And it, this is about ensuring that, as that diminishes, which it will over time, that it is ramp the, the, the rest of the funding that will come uh, from the UK Government through the Shared Prosperity Funds and the other structural funds is ramped up, which is a very firm commitment that was given by Michael Gove. Paul Sweeney? Well, I hear the um, member's point, uh, but I don't agree with the, that, that perception or that assertion, because even the Treasury Select Committee in the House of Commons said as much when its report into the funds questioned why one of the centrepieces of the government's levelling up ambitions was to be reduced to such an extent. So the idea that it will be completely offset is simply not correct. And Deputy Presiding Officer, it's not just the Treasury Select Committee calling this out. The Scottish Government, the Welsh Government, the Northern Irish Government, the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, the Metro Mayors are all saying the same thing. And they can't all be incorrect. They will be worse off. And that is not acceptable. As usual, it's ordinary working people who will pay the price. And we're already seeing gross inequalities across our country. One in four children live in poverty. Almost a quarter of all households live in fuel poverty. Life expectancy in our poorest communities is now falling and food bank use is rising. Each of those are symptoms of political choices. And it beggars belief that after 12 years of Tory austerity, their failed macroeconomic policy of public disinvestment and resultant low economic growth is set to continue. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is also true to say that the Scottish Government have been asleep at the wheel on this too. Their time in office has seen council budgets slashed every year. A laissez-faire approach to Scotland's economy, with a productivity rate drastically lagging behind the OECD, OECD average, and potentially EU structural funds and regional selective assistance being misallocated and inefficiently managed through the enterprise agencies. A timid acceptance of Tory laissez-faire economics and a failure to develop an industrial strategy that would provide high-quality, high-paid jobs for people in every town and city across the country. The point on council funding, absent from the government's motion, is particularly important to this debate. We know that Scotland's councils have borne the brunt of funding cuts, £250 million cut this year alone. But I do have concerns about the UK government's approach to providing funds directly to local authorities bypassing the Scottish Government entirely. On these benches, we fundamentally believe in empowering local communities, and that means providing adequate funding, but also providing them with the powers to make their own choices. However, we do have a devolution settlement in place, and I'm afraid the Tory plan quite clearly circumvents that settlement, meaning we cannot simply support that method of delivery. Deputy Presiding Officer, I also just want to touch on the issue of cooperation. We know that the Scottish and UK governments hold colossal differences of opinion on a whole host of different policy areas, but on this we really do need them to work together in the national interest. If the UK Shared Prosperity Fund is to provide the same benefits of the EU structural funds it is replacing, I would argue that the way those funds are delivered is of fundamental importance. We cannot simply have a situation where both governments are arguing incessantly, as they have done previously on things like city deals, about who gave the money to who and what flag should appear on billboards on construction sites 
But sadly, that's exactly what I think is about to happen. I'm sure we'll be subjected to those tedious arguments over the course of today's debate. And frankly, it is not good enough. As the Scottish Parliament's Research Centre's own report uh, articulates, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, the, uh, the longer the UK's replacement takes to bring that in, the more questions will be asked about any costly gaps in funding. Stakeholders and beneficiaries who may have been waiting since 2017 to know how the UK Shared Prosperity Fund will operate are being forced to bide their time a while more. So my plea to both the Scottish and UK governments is quite straightforward. Grow up, work together in the best interests of people across Scotland and begin to match the le incessant levels of facile rhetoric with tangible actions. Thank you. I now call on Willie Rennie. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Rennie. Yeah, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I think Liz Smith made, as is often uh, the case, a reasonable and constructive contribution to this afternoon's uh, debate. She focused on the, the practical steps that need to be taken and indeed challenged, I think, her own government to match the commitments and the promises um, that it has made in the past on the level of funds. But at best, there is confusion um, over the level of the funds. But at worst, there's a potential cut of hundreds of millions of pounds. I mean, if you look at the, the annual contribution from EU structural funds between 2014 and 2020, it was about 2,000 million pounds uh, a year. The National Council for Voluntary Organisations uh, in England, they estimate that the fund will only provide 866 million, cut of 1.1 billion pounds every year. And we've heard also from the Minister about the Treasury Committee report about a cut um, of 40 per cent. So what will be the impact, if it's the worst case scenario, what will be the impact on projects across the UK? Because this is not just a Scottish issue, I have to say to the Minister, this is a, a UK-wide issue. It's almost six years since the referendum and two years since we actually left the EU, but still the Conservative government has not worked out what it is doing. They're moving far too slowly which is causing massive uncertainty in the sector. Organisations face a cliff edge on their funding as a result. Jobs are at risk, as is the vital work that they do. Pre-launch guidance was only issued last month. Further details won't be available for weeks, and it will take months for applications to be submitted and processed, even though existing funds will run out by December. Time is marching on, I have to say, to Liz Smith. So the Conservative government must speed up and end the uncertainty. There is also great doubt about the role of funds in the skills development. At a time when we are short of sufficient skilled workers, this is incredibly short-sighted. I have to say, I think the SNP government are in danger of solely focusing on their exclusion from the process when organisations across the country are primarily concerned about the shortfall in funding and the lack of certainty. I do want partnership and cooperation. I believe in federalism. I do actually think it's the answer uh, to the problems that we are facing over this and many other post-Brexit issues that we've been debating uh, today. I would argue that we should have the structures of engagement for areas of common interest. This is one area that would benefit from a partnership approach. I think most people in this country want governments to just get on. They want them to work together in partnership, put aside the constitutional differences and actually make things work. And they need to do that in partnership with local authorities. Spats over who are in charge are completely irrelevant to most people on the ground, especially when jobs and opportunities are at stake. And I think Paul Sweeney was absolutely bang on it with his comments. I would urge the Conservative government to establish a joint council for UK shared prosperity, for the fund and for the levelling up agenda. The council would include representatives of the constituent authorities in the United Kingdom. It could work in partnership with local communities and local government on the development of these programmes. So let's draw on the skills, the expertise and the talents of everyone at every level of government to make a success of the funding. Let's end the uncertainty over the level of funding 
and let's make sure that those jobs are saved and those opportunities are seized. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move to the open debate. I would advise members that there is no time in hand and therefore any uh, interventions, should members wish to accept them, must be accommodated within the members' allotted time. I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I haven't forgotten that it was an utterly disingenuous vote leave campaign led by the leadership of Michael Gove and Boris Johnson that's led Scotland to this point. Whilst I await further developments with interest, as it stands, the UK structural funds are a mess. As I see it, there are five summary issues. First, there's not been, and I have still have limited confidence there will be any meaningful engagement with a democratically elected Scottish Government to ensure funds are compatible with Scotland's economic policies. Second, there's no effective governance in place with, for example, no sensible approach to a nationwide evaluation of impact. It would seem in place of robust governance, we are to have Mr Gove whispering, trust me. Third, the methodology in place for categorising areas of need is at best amateurish. Fourth, the UK funds set up a competition where our local authorities must compete with one another rather than work in concert towards nationally agreed goals. Fifth, the most sensible solution was readily available, but for political reasons rejected. To continue with the precedent already set with EU structural funds and allow our Scottish Government and those of us in this Parliament to shape their best use for the people of Scotland. When I challenged Mr Gove in the Finance and Public Administration Committee last week about the methodology for funding projects, including the placing of Orkney, Shetland and the Highlands in the lowest category of need for transport infrastructure, along with the City of London, he obfuscated. He asked for the Scottish Government to provide him with more information and transparency, whilst at the same time seeking to impose an approach that excludes them from control. So let us briefly consider the track record of Mr Gove for transparency. As reported in 2017 by, Mr. by Peter Gagan writing for Open Democracy, Gove and others were closely tied to the Legatum Institute, a Mayfair-based think tank funded by a ty tycoon who made his money during the wild capitalism period in post-Soviet Russia. But Mr Gove's belief in transparency when asked about his connections to people at Legatum led him to this florid reply. The blessed sponge of amnesia wipes the memory slate clean. However bad his memory, it didn't stop the appointment of Legatum's Matthew Elliott to become chief executive of Vote Leave. And after the referendum, the infamous letter from Gove and Johnson to the then Prime Minister Theresa May encouraging a hard Brexit was widely reported as having been assisted by the involvement of Russian-funded Legatum personnel. Gove and Johnson's hard Brexit is costing Scotland dear. Furthermore, Gove advocated and lobbied to avoid publishing the Russia report prior to the 2019 election into election meddling, money laundering, cyber attacks and buying influence with dirty Russian money. To this day, we've never seen the full report, thanks to Mr Gove. <laughs> Finally, I also note that the tycoon behind Michael Gove's favourite institute is reported to have been behind a board coup that saw Putin associate become chair of Gazprom, the huge energy company fueling Putin's war in Ukraine. So no amount of fawning from the Scottish Tories towards Gove can hide the fact that he's a charlatan with a demonstrable lack of concern for the democratic will of the Scottish people. Trust him and his assurances that they're around the UK structural funds at your peril. Thank you. I now call Murdo Fraser to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Fraser. Um, well, thank you, Deputy President. So perhaps we can get back to the subject of the debate. Um, which is looking at the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, a very welcome part of the UK government's levelling up agenda. And despite what we've heard from the SNP benches this afternoon, an approach that has been warmly welcomed and embraced across Scotland. Now, the starting point for this discussion is that Scotland has two governments, a government here in Edinburgh and another government 
in London. And both have a crucial role to play in supporting infrastructure, helping communities grow and assisting with economic growth right across the whole United Kingdom. And we see that already in the successful rollout of the city growth deals, now covering every single part of Scotland. These now see a total investment of £1.49 billion, with projects such as a new concert hall for Edinburgh, the National Tartan Centre in Stirling, the Net Zero Technology Centre in Aberdeen. On top of that, we've just seen the announcement of two new free ports in Scotland, backed by £52 million, a £4.8 billion infrastructure <laughs> investment in towns via the Leveling Up Fund, and a £2.6 billion shared prosperity fund, providing cash directly to councils to replace EU funds. Every single one of these programmes is good news for the UK and good news for Scotland and should be warmly welcomed by everyone in this chamber. Now, the UK Government made a commitment to replace EU funding, which of course is what the Leveling Up Fund will do. And as Liz Smith pointed out earlier, we do still of course have EU legacy funding, which diminishes over time, and the Shared Prosperity Fund will ramp up to fill that gap. We will be in a position where Scotland will receive more in EU replacement funds than it ever did receive directly from the EU. And again, that is something we should celebrate. And it's curious that you know, we hear so many complaints from the SNP about this funding. They never complained when the funding came from the EU, but suddenly it comes from the UK instead of the EU, and they are full of complaints. Mr Johnson wishes to intervene. I do. Daniel Johnson. Clearly, I'm not making this clear enough, but I'm thankful to the member. I, I, I mean, does he have any evidence that the funding is going to match the EU? Or are we just going to take it on good faith of, from Michael Gove and others? Murder Fraser. Well, I, I'm disappointed that Mr Johnson, who considers himself to be a supporter of the United Kingdom, is not taking the United Kingdom government at its word <laughs> that more money will be forthcoming. He should have more confidence in the United Kingdom government. And I would say... I would say to him, and I would say in particular to those uh, on the SNP benches, you know, when they talk about EU funding, they suggest it was all sweetness and light and there were no problems. This time last year, the Scottish Government were facing a fine of £190 million due to irregularities over the European Social Fund and European Regional Development Fund. I asked the Minister earlier, what's happened to that fine? How much has been paid? What's the status of that? Perhaps when he's winding up, he can confirm uh, these points. So, presiding officer, what is being proposed is very welcome. Indeed, even SNP councillors have welcomed this money. Councillor Ian Nicholson of Renfrewshire Council, which is to receive the single largest investment from the levelling up funds of £38 million, said he was delighted to receive this money. What a pity that enthusiasm is not reflected in his parliamentary colleagues here in this chamber. And crucially, this money goes direct to local councils. What a difference in approach from a UK Conservative government compared to the SNP government here. This is an SNP government that is treating councils in Scotland woefully, cutting their funding year after year while expecting them to do more and more. They're a party who claim to be a party of localism, but in practice treat our local councils as whipping boys. In contrast, we have a Conservative government in Westminster trusting our local councils, working with them and making sure they get the money they need. And that is why the Shared Prosperity Fund, presiding officer, is so welcome. That is why the SNP are so hostile to it, because they don't like local government being empowered. And that's why we support the amendment in the name of Liz Smith. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Roger Grant. Up to four minutes, please. Mr. Thank Gibson. you, presiding officer. And firstly, I wish to record my disappointment that such a short time has been allocated for an issue of such importance, so a full exploration of relevant matters is not possible. But I'll touch on a few. When in the European Union, Scotland's allocated €944 million Euros in structural funding under the 2014-20 budget framework, to be unlocked, this had to be matched by the UK, leading to investment of around £183 million a year. The question remains, will the UK Government make good the EU funding we will no longer receive? In 2017, the Tories committed to setting up a replacement structure called the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, but no progress was made for years as self-imposed deadlines came and went. Tellingly, the UK Government found time to push through their Internal Market Act in 2020 without consulting the Scottish Parliament. This convened, uh, contravened the Seoul Convention as the UK afforded itself powers to undermine this Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government on devolved matters MSPs were elected to deliver on. 
When in March 2021 the levelling up fund was announced, it was immediately clear there would be an enormous cash shortfall. Despite repeated calls by Scottish ministers and SNP MPs, no detail was revealed until the 2021 autumn statement. On 27th of January, Westminster's Treasury Committee, chaired by Tory MP Mel Stride, reported that the UK Share Prosperity Fund up to 24-25 will suffer a 40% annual cut compared with EU structural funding. This is worrying as we emerge from the pandemic and the impact of Brexit itself. Last week, we welcomed the Secretary of State for levelling up Michael Gove MP to the Finance and Public Administration Committee. We had hoped to see Mr Gove back in November. However, once he found the time to come to Holyrood on the back of his address to the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, he was very forthcoming, which made our session a most valuable one. When asked why the Treasury Committee expressed such great concerns, Mr Gove responded, and I quote, the inference I would draw it is a perfectly legitimate misunderstanding to conflate the UK Shared Prosperity Fund money with previous EU funding. He argued rather vaguely and somewhat unconvincingly, he did not convince a Tory-led Westminster Committee after all, that alongside the UK Shared Prosperity Fund resources would be delivered from sources such as levelling up and Scotland would overall see no loss. The bottom line is the Committee still awaits details on where the £183 million per year will come from. Scottish ministers have not been consulted, nor do they have any role in investment proposals on decisions relating to devolved matters. New guidance offers no evidence of respecting devolution or acknowledging the Scottish Government as an equal partner. As part of his, it will be all right on the night approach, Mr Gove said, and I quote again, it is explicitly the case that for the UK Share Prosperity Fund, we want to ensure that there is intensive dialogue between us and the Scottish Government and its ministers on the basis on which the money should be distributed. No reason was given as to why that has not yet happened. A specific case I raised was that of the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney, the world's first and only accredited wave and tidal test centre for marine energy. Over 16 years, MEC has contributed £306 million to the UK economy, supporting almost 200 jobs. Between 2016 and 2020, it received more than £17.4 million from Europe, 52 per cent of its total funding. MEC felt compelled to express its concern that the levelling up paper published on 2 February suggests that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund will be allocated entirely through local authorities. This deliberate bypassing of this Parliament straight to councils creates a real risk that MEC and other unique organisations crucial to innovation and addressing climate change will miss out on vital funding. Such anomalies seem to surprise Mr Gove, who then committed to speaking to MEC. However, his policy-making on the hoof approach is not a sustainable way of operating these funds and lacks the practical setup and security of EU structural funding. Presiding officer, while I welcome the Secretary of State's clarifications, we are still to see cold hard numbers confirming that Scotland will not lose out, nor have Scottish and Welsh ministers been adequately consulted regarding a fund that goes live next month. The UK Government must actively engage and it must do so today. Thank you. I call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The benefit of EU structural and social funds was a game changer in the Highlands and Islands. Communities were inspired to grow and develop, used it to build bridges, causeways, roads and factories. Communities were linked and given the tools to lead them to prosperity. In the Highlands and Islands, there was scarcely a road built in the 1990s and early 200s that didn't have an EU flag beside it. It made a huge change and for once shone a light on some of the most marginalised communities in the country. Sadly, when the SNP government came into power, they quickly took control of the fund from local, local organisations and the impact decreased markedly. Their obsession with centralisation diluted the impact. We now see with Brexit, those funds removed altogether and the replacement offered by the UK government is absolutely blind to peripherality. In the Highlands and Islands, we have sparse population, poor transport links, and yet not one of our council areas attracts level one funding. Orkney, Shetland, and the Western Isles, where there are areas of extreme poverty, where people have to depend on ferries and flights to get to the rest of the country. Yet they find themselves in level three alongside areas such as Buckinghamshire and Cambridge. It is senseless. I wrote to Michael Gove, trying to get him to understand the situation, telling him that rural poverty and deprivation do not show up easily in the indicators used by both Scottish and UK governments, which is largely postcode based. 
In rural areas, the poor live side by side with the very rich, and therefore the real disadvantage faced in those communities is hidden. In Highland, this is further hidden due to the success of some parts of Inverness. But despite this success, in Inverness, there is a de decade of difference in life expectancy, depending in which direction I walk for 15 minutes from my house. People living within walking distance of each other that have had markedly life, different life chances. Outside Inverness, throughout the Highlands and Islands, disadvantage is manifested by depopulation. Our young people are forced to seek employment and housing, and many areas are extremely fragile because of this. Yet the whole region is termed Level 2 or Level 3. I believe the UK government has a real opportunity to make a difference by using the levelling up fund in a way which would demonstrate an understanding of remote rural communities. Our area provides opportunities for the rest of the country. We are the lungs of the country with our wide open spaces. And we are set to become the generator of energy too, and yet we struggle for survival. This funding provides an opportunity to level up our society, but unfortunately, it looks like it will be there to provide sweeteners for part of the country, parts of the country that voted Conservative for the first time, an attempt to buy their loyalty while doing down our most peripheral regions. I appeal to both our governments to recognise the needs of rural communities and find a, way, a better way to reflect their needs. If not, they're likely to disappear. These communities are best able to understand their own needs, but they need to be empowered and to be given the funds to allow them to build and repopulate these areas. They will grow and flourish if we recognise their need. This is a time not for political opportunism. It is a time for action. Thank you. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you very much, Thing Officer. Thing Officer, I welcome this debate and at the outset I also welcome investment coming into my Greenock and Inverclyde constituency and also to Scotland. I would like to see more of it and I'm quite sure that others across the Chamber would like to see more going into their constituencies also. The fact that there is a so-called uh, shared prosperity fund and a so-called levelling up fund and, and also a levelling up agenda highlights the fact that Scotland and also the north of England have been hammered financially by successive UK governments irrespective as to whoever has been in power at Westminster. It shows that the Union has not worked for Scotland. At least we in Scotland have got a chance uh, that, uh, and I certainly do look forward, I certainly do look forward to that day when we win our next independence referendum. We all know, we all know whether MSPs across this chamber want to accept it or not that Scotland has never ever been top of the agenda at Westminster. From Margaret Thatcher's planning, uh, cutting Scotland's budget, as well as trying to keep these cuts, and I quote, invisible, in addition to the thousands of shipyard and engineering jobs in my constituency, as well as the steel and coal jobs across Scotland and parts of England and Wales being put onto the scrap heap, to Tony Blair's content, uh, sorry, content for allegedly keeping public spending higher in Scotland per head as a price worth paying to maintain the union, to Boris Johnson's, and I quote, my argument to the Treasury, is that a pound spent in Croydon is far more of value to the country on a strict utilitarian calculus than a pound spent in Strathclyde. He also added, and I quote, you would generate jobs and growth in Strathclyde far more effectively if you invest in Hackney or in Croydon or other parts of London. Now, I make no apologies for not rolling out the red carpet to the current Tory UK government and their so-called generosity in various funds that they now consider for Scotland and elsewhere in these islands. I'm not prepared to beg for the crumbs off the table when the disrespect agenda that the UK, that the disrespect agenda that the UK establishment have had for Scotland is there for all to see, and it has been for many, many generations. After the Brexit referendum, which has resulted in Scotland being dragged out of the EU against their will, the Prime Minister Theresa May met with the First Minister to discuss a variety of issues. And one of the key reporting matters at the time was the admission from the Prime Minister that the UK government could not match the funds that the EU were providing. So, in effect, we are suffering a double whammy of being dragged out of the EU against our will and also being shortchanged to the sum of £183 million per annum. 
No matter how the UK government tried to spin it, the new funds being debated today will not come anywhere near the sums of money that have been cut from Scotland over the many, many generations. According to the NPC think tank, in January, the £4.8 billion levelling up fund announced at Westminster's spending review last March aims to, and I quote, invest in infrastructure that improves everyday life across the UK. In Scotland, the 20 per cent of local authorities with the highest homelessness rates received less levelling up funding than the 20 per cent of local authorities with the lowest homelessness rates. Of the 20 per cent of local authorities with the highest homelessness rates in Scotland, three of these have received no levelling up funding. And meanwhile, of the 20% the most deprived local authorities, four have received no levelling up funding Inverclyde, North Lanarkshire, Dundee, and East Ayrshire. Uh, no. In addition to the amount of allocated funding per head, is less than in England. Ultimate presenting officer, I will welcome investment when and if it comes to Inverclyde. It is long, long overdue, but also another example of the centralisation agenda from Westminster trampling all over devolution. It is the disrespect agenda writ large. The Westminster power grab is happening. We are witnessing it with the so-called levelling up fund and the so-called UK Shared Prosperity Fund. Michael Gove last week uh, spoke to the Finance Committee indicating how his government will engage in devolved areas. Sharing prosperity is not something that happens in one parliamentary term, bearing in mind there have been generations of Please Westminster conclude, removing McMillan. opportunities from Scotland. And with that, the sooner we are out of it, the better. Thank you. Thank you. I call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The UK Government's proposed arrangements for the UK Shared Prosperity Fund tells us three things. First, that the UK Government has little interest in keeping the Conservative Party's 2019 manifesto commitment that promised it would, and at a minimum, match the level of EU spending. What we see being proposed is a near 40% of what was provided by European Union structural funds. I know we are all becoming accustomed to broken promises by the Prime Minister, but this is bad for communities and bad for trust in politics. Second, the UK Government also has little interest in respecting devolution or enhancing community participation and engagement in decision-making. Even though money will be spent on matters that fall within devolved competencies like transport, skills, economic development, the Scottish Government and our communities have very little, if, if any, say in allocation decisions. This is worrying, given how different the economic development landscape is in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK, never mind what it says about devolution. And third, we will have to work even harder than before to tackle the inequalities that exist across and within different parts of Scotland and reorient our economy towards well-being and the just transition. Last summer, the Institute for Government published a report on the UK SPF highlighting key risks of the UK Government's approach. Fragmentation of service provision, confused accountability, duplication of effort, funding uncertainty and increased intergovernmental tensions. That same Institute for Government, Government report set out several recommendations to mitigate these risks clear allocation criteria, reduced bureaucracy. The irony of additional red tape from a Brexiteer government is not lost on me. They also say better consultation with and engagement of devolved nations, genuine partnership working, match funding models, clarification over governance and operational management, and more. And yet nothing we've seen from the UK government to date addresses any of these issues. A fundamental problem with the UK's economy over the last 40 plus years has been a deep-seated reluctance to invest in the infrastructure we need for the well-being of our citizens. It's been worse in England, where, for example, privatised water companies have paid massive dividends to shareholders while allowing the water and sewerage systems to degrade. We desperately need more money for infrastructure for investment in our future, in the telecommunications on which much of our lives will be based through high-speed broadband, where we lag many countries. We need the energy and storage investment to wean ourselves off fossil fuels, as it has become so painfully obvious over the last year with exponentially rising fossil fuel costs. Yet what we have here is a drastic cut to the funds we would have received through the EU. Many people voted for Brexit because they thought it would mean more investment in the fabric we rely on for our society. 
While it's clear that the leaders of that campaign had no interest in keeping their promises, it is vital that we don't repeat the failure to those people and, and fail them twice. Public borrowing is still cheap. We can build the houses we need, the, railway ne the railways we need, the high-speed broadband we need. We can support genuine community regeneration that recognises local variations and specificities by having governance and engagement structures that centre local voices. Yet, this UK Tory government insists on, yet again, impoverishing us now and in the future. I can only speculate why. But I know that we cannot afford it now, and we certainly cannot afford it in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I call Miles Briggs, the last speaker in the open debate. Th thank you, uh, President Officer. And it was perhaps a mistake of the Minister for Parliament to timetable the two debates we've had uh, this afternoon. The first one being the local government finance order with SNP and Green ministers cutting £250 million from local authorities. And this debate, which will give powers and resources to local authorities and £2.6 billion of additional funding. Yeah. Now, the Shared Prosperity Fund is a central pillar of the UK government's ambitious levelling up agenda and a significant component of that is the support for communities across Britain. The fund will provide £2.6 billion in new funding of local investment by March 2025, with all areas of the UK receiving an allocation from the fund via funding formula rather than a competition. Now, the purpose of the Shared Prosperity Fund and the UK Government's levelling up agenda is to reduce inequalities where they occur anywhere in Britain. That's something I would have thought all of us would agree about. This applies as equally to Scotland as it does for any other nation or region across the United Kingdom. And I'd hope that SNP and Green Ministers and MSPs would agree with many of the principles that the Shared Prosperity Fund actually focuses on. For example, investment and resources to areas in Scotland that are less prosperous and working to help build stronger, safer and more prosperous communities for all of us. Projects such as the re restoration of the B-listed grant and gas holder here in my region, for example, are designed to spread opportunities and improve public services, restore a sense of community, local pride and belonging, as well as empowering local leaders and our communities. And at the very time when SNP and Green Ministers are cutting local budgets, the UK Government is looking to inject finances directly to areas around the country that need them the most. I have already outlined, but I note the Scottish Government motion doesn't even mention local government and the important role they must play in helping to improve and empower communities across our country. Perhaps that is at the heart of what SNP and Green ministers and MSPs are complaining about today, that what actually we are seeing is powers going to local authorities, not to SNP and Green ministers. Now, Scottish Conservatives support initiatives that move towards greater local empowerment, and I believe the Shared Prosperity Fund can help deliver that very outcome. outcome. Scottish local authorities are receptive to help to take forward bids, and the Shared Prosperity Fund, and, uh, as well as the levelling up agenda. And I know that COSLA have had many positive engagements with Michael Gove already on how that can be best achieved. The UK Government has made very clear that they want to work with the Scottish Government and make best possible use of funding across Scotland. And I hope that the attitude we've seen from members maybe changes if we're going to be able to see that taken forward. As has already been stated, local authorities across Scotland are receiving their share of £172 million in the first tranche of investment. Now, I sincerely hope, as I've said, that SNP and Green Ministers will start to get on board with the delivery of this UK Shared Prosperity Fund and start the positive engagement with all our communities and our councillors who will be elected after May's elections as well to get the best possible outcome for all of our communities. Communities across Scotland are, have a proud record of coming together. Sorry, the, I can, does the member want to intervene? Do I have the time back? If, Thank if you. I, 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 Christine talking, Graham, talking to myself, but if you want me to talk to you, I'm quite happy to do it. I think the issue here at the core of it is that this is bypassing the devolved settlement. That's the basis of it. And that Westminster is choosing which local authorities to send its money to. It just happens to be places where they're looking for votes. Mr. I, don't, I, don't agree with, I, I don't agree with that point, but I think... The, the real question which many members who are clapping away maybe need to think is what have the SNP actually done for 14 years to help 
actually bring prosperity to many communities. Nothing at all. But communities across Scotland have a proud record of coming together and pioneering innovative work to deliver community regeneration projects. That's what we need to help achieve. It's vital that we realise the potential of all our communities, and the Shared Prosperity Fund will help achieve that. I support the amendment in Liz Smith's name. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to closing speeches, and I call Daniel Johnson. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. The structural funds play, have played an important role in Scotland, and I think Paul Sweeney set out, I think, very well why they, they are important, and indeed you know, why uh, they are long awaited. But uh, more importantly, and the point that I think has been bis missed by many contributions, that Scotland remains a country of inequality. As Paul Sweeney pointed out, that depending on where you live in the country, your life chances, your ability to, to earn, are greatly uh, d uh, 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 great differences. Uh, between the highest and the lowest productivity in Scotland, there's a 40% gap between the Western Isles and Edinburgh. And that is not sustainable. And while I have a huge number of criticisms of what the Conservative government have brought forward, I, I have yet to hear a response from the Scottish government on what they are doing to target those regional inequalities. Uh, but ultimately, these funds fall short, both in terms of how they're structured, but also their quantum. As Paul Sweeney pointed out, they are 40% lower than the EU structural funds they um, uh, replace. Now, I perhaps admire Murdo Fraser's choice of ties, but I think that's the limit of my admiration this afternoon, because it's nothing short of chutzpah what you presented, that I am to take it on Michael Gove's word, because he's a minister of the Crown, that more money is coming. And, and indeed, if we were to listen to his further remarks, apparently the Conservatives are the champions of local government and local democracy, despite the fact that they cut their funding by 40% in England. So I think we should uh, uh, take no uh, lectures from the Conservatives when it comes to local government funding whatsoever. But I think the most important contributions this afternoon were perhaps from uh, my colleague Rhoda Grant, but also Michelle Thompson. Because actually when you look at the detail, about how these funds have been structured, about how the indexation has been uh, put together, that, that you come up with a system whereby the Highlands and Islands are put together in the same category as Buckinghamshire, you surely know that there is something very wrong with the way that this has been put together. Indeed, Michael Cove's contribution, while I very much enjoyed him being at committee uh, on Thursday, it was very much a, this is a work in progress, don't worry, we'll look at it. And yes, I know that these uh, measures are very narrow, but they will be improved. It, it, as somebody put, it was very much a, it will be all right on the night. I'm very happy to give way to this. Liz Smith. Grateful, Mr Johnson. Does he recognise that Mr Gove accepted that there could be issues about some of the modelling? It was not deliberate uh, in, in terms of trying to deny particular funding to specific areas. But if we do have issues about the modelling that is not seen as objective as it could be, we are to go back to him with cl clear examples of where there might be problems. Daniel Johnson. Uh, Elizabeth accurately, uh, I think, represents what was said. But if we are to believe what these funds are supposed to do, the significance and the importance and, and what they will deliver, the fact that they are still essentially work in progress, I think, uh, trouble, is deeply troubling, and I think exposes the flawed and, frankly, hurried nature that they appear to be put together with. Now, I, with others, have deep concerns about the lack of coordination. Indeed, I think Liz Smith put it very well in committee that if we are not coordinated in terms of the measures that, that are used uh, to look at these things, that in terms of the coordination with other priorities. You, I think, run the very real risk of incompatible and divergent efforts happening across governments. So while I, 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 you know, I am concerned by, I think, the eagerness of some members to want to uh, uh, you know, draw out the constitutional arguments in this, I think the coordination points are ones that are far too easily glossed over by the Conservative benches. Ultimately, though, I think perhaps this debate was best summed up by Willie Rennie, because I think ultimately, six years on, Surely we should expect uh, better. We need better clarity, but ultimately we just want our governments to get on and deliver. I don't think that's too much to ask. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Donald Cameron up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I, can I um, once Willie Rennie stopped telling jokes, can I... Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> He's applauding himself. Um, 
Can I just make one comment about something that, that the minister made? Uh, um, he spoke about um, meeting with Neil O'Brien. Now, um, it's my view that Neil O'Brien is one of the most thoughtful and intelligent ministers in the UK government, uh, and he's in the um, Department for Leveling Up. And I do hope that, and I've said this with the best intentions, that he, he treats those ministerial relations well, because I think he is a, a rising star. Um, can I begin also by associating myself with the remarks of Liz Smith, who stated unequivocally three points about what really matters here. She said that the very best interests of Scotland, particularly in relation to our economic recovery matter, the empowerment of our local authorities matters, and the need for proper, realistic, joined up work between the UK government, Scottish government, and local authorities matters. She's absolutely right. Um, and listening to this debate, I had a sense of deja vu about a similar debate we had uh, several months ago when the SNP government took aim at UK government policy here. And the broad thrust of their argument was the same. It was to say that the levelling up agenda undermines devolution, neglects parts of Scotland, doesn't match existing funding. And I just don't accept those claims stand up to scrutiny. Um, the idea that the Shared Prosperity Fund undermines devolution, devolution settlement is not a credible view. Let me take Christine Graham's point head on. As I, noticed in the, as I noted in the last debate, there is nothing in a devolution settlement, nothing, not one provision in any of the Scotland Acts that prevents the UK government funding devolved policy areas at all. There is an underlying contradiction in the SNP position. They are quite happy, as Murray Fraser said, quite happy to receive funds from the EU, but outraged when funding comes from the UK government. Um, I, I will very briefly, if I get the time. Just Christine simply Graham. to say that in my long time in here, perhaps too long for some people, I've never seen a UK government behaving in this way towards devol devolution and devolved areas, not once. So what the Shared Prosperity Fund does, and she hasn't answered the question because she can't point to a provision in the devolution settlement that, 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 says, that does what she says it does. But what the Shared Prosperity Fund does is it places funding directly in the hands of local authorities and others on the front line so they can deliver projects that they're seeking funding for. And there just seems to be extraordinary unwillingness by the Scottish Government to acknowledge this. It's their centralising tendency. There's no reason whatsoever, no, I'm sorry, I don't have time. I would normally, I don't have time. There's no reason whatsoever to prevent the UK government passing funds directly to local authorities and the organisations that seek it. As Murdo Fraser said, that's been welcomed at a local level by SNP councillors. As Miles Briggs said, Cosler and the UK government are very positive. Are they having positive conversations? Now, let me deal with the, the point that Rhoda Grant made, and it is a very important one, and I, too, represent the Highlands and Islands about the fact that uh, certain parts of Scotland are not receiving the same priority. And now I welcome the fact that some areas, such as Argyll and Butte, the Western Isles, are considered as priority areas for community renewal funding. But I do note that the, some parts of the Highlands and Islands are split between priority two and priority three zones for levelling up funding. Now, many of the local authorities in priority three have benefited from growth deals. And I also note that in the first round of community renewal funding, uh, something like the Seaweed Academy in Argyll and Butte has received funding. The greatest pub in Scotland, the Old Forge in Noydert, has received community ownership funding. And, and I also think it's important to note that while priority bans uh, give indications of priority, they're not fixed and they're not insurmountable. And this fund has other criteria for investment, which allows regions in lower priority bands to receive funds earlier than higher bands if it is considered a better bid. But with all that said, uh, and let me be very clear, I'm sorry, let me be very clear about this. I will not stint in advocating for the region that I represent, and I will continue to put pressure on UK government colleagues to recognise the fact that remote and rural communities conclude. in the Highlands and Islands need investment and assistance in light of the many varied challenges that exist. So, in conclusion, presiding officer, um, we believe that the Shared Prosperity Fund will empower local authorities, so let's grasp this opportunity and reap the benefits. Thank you. And I call on Richard Lockhead to wind up. Up to six minutes, Minister. I'd also like to thank all members for their contributions to this uh, important debate. And I do feel we all want the best for our communities and to tackle inequalities uh, and for job creation as well. And I want to say to Donald Cameron at the outset that I had a constructive meeting with Mr O'Brien last week, and I do hope that he continues to be constructive. I hope he'll listen to the arguments I put on behalf of the, the Scottish Government, and I hope that he delivers, and time will tell in the coming weeks and months. But we will continue to negotiate and discuss constructively with Mr O'Brien um, and his colleagues in the UK Government. 
We have learnt a few things from this debate today, of course. Firstly, we have learnt from the Conservative Party that true devolution involves sidelining the Scottish Parliament and ignoring the Scottish Parliament. And the logical conclusion of the Conservative Party's position, which is not surprising, they have never been enthusiastic for Scottish self-government, is that we should just scrap this place and just scrap the Scottish Parliament. That is the logical conclusion of all the arguments put forward by the Conservative members in Parliament today. Now, presenting officer, I am quite attracted to not having any Scottish Tory MSPs in this country, but the rest of us want to respect Scottish democracy. And opinion poll after opinion poll, year after year, shows that the people of Scotland have more trust in the Scottish Parliament to look after their interests way ahead than what they do for Westminster. Liz Smith. Uh, could I ask Mr Lockhead why he thinks that local government has been so enthusiastic about many aspects of the Shared Prosperity Fund? Minister. COSLA, COSLA and others want devolution respected by the UK Government when it comes to the successive funds for uh, uh, the European funds that we have lost out on because of Brexit or will do in the next couple of years. I should also say to Paul Sweeney that the arguments and discussions we are having today are not tedious arguments. They are not tedious arguments. They are about job creation in Scotland's communities. They are about tackling inequalities and about doing what is best for Scotland. And it is about the UK Government and the Conservative Government delivering on promises made to the people of Scotland. Remember, they said that we would not lose out from Brexit, that the money would be matched, and now we face, in the words of the UK Treasury Committee, a 40 per cent cut. And they also said, and let us all remember this, because I am sure we all do remember, that Brexit would lead to the strengthening of the Scottish Parliament and the strengthening of, of devolution. Uh, and of course, that is not what is happening here, uh, they are bypassing. Can I just say that you know, <clears throat> the approach being taken by the UK Government at the moment means we lose out on the autonomy we enjoyed under the European Union. Can I just remind all members that we had far more control over these allocations and governance and policy aims while in the EU than under the current offer by the UK Government? And that gets to the heart of this debate. <clears throat> and I do think Michelle Thompson hit the nail on the head when she spoke about the irony, and I think she said Michael Gove said this, and Mr O'Brien said it to me last week in our meeting, that the UK Government relies on the knowledge and expertise of the Scottish Government to make sure the successive funds will work properly and deliver for the people of Scotland. Yet at the same time, and this is the point that Michelle Thompson made, is that the UK Government wants to sideline the Scottish Parliament and sideline the Scottish Government. They can't have it both ways. Liz Smith. Yep. Would Mr Lockhead acknowledge that when it comes to things like the city deals, there has been first-class engagement with the Westminster Government, the Scottish Government, the local authorities and the local stakeholders. That surely is joined up thinking that is very much to the benefit of Scotland. Minister. Mr. Mr. President, Officer, Liz Smith has just made our point for us because we were treated as an equal partner with the city regional growth deals and with the successor to EU funds, we were being carved out and sidelined. Uh, so Liz Smith has actually made the, the Government's point uh, for us in our intervention. Can I just say that since the 1970s, Scotland has received and delivered over £6 billion of EU structural funding. That investment has enabled the Scottish Government and our partners to fund a huge number of projects of national importance. It's funded, and Rhoda Grant spoke uh, well about the importance of those funds in transforming the Highlands and Islands. It funded the creation of the University of the Highlands and Islands, these funds. It, the construction of the roads uh, and the spinal route throughout the Western Isles and delivered schemes such as the modern apprenticeship and low carbon travel and transport programmes we have seen across our communities as well. And all of that, all of that has been put at risk if we lose these EU funds. The development of the UK Shared Prosperity Fund has no consideration or respect for the wealth of expertise built from decades of successful delivery of these types of projects by the Scottish Government. Instead, developed in isolation, the UK Government are proposing that this fund be used for lockable bike stands, graffiti removal and litter picking in the name of local pride. The resemblance between the projects and purposes of this fund and EU investments is faint, frustratingly faint, and we have been badly let down by the UK Government's lack of vision for this fund. Now, nearly 18 months ago, we set out a vision for how a Scottish uh, Shared Prosperity Fund could be used. You will know that we aim to reduce economic inequalities in the poor regions by working with them. We wanted to invest in projects that reduce poverty, provide skills and job opportunities, and grow the regional business base as well. And we set these aims in the context of the well-being economy we want to create and tackling climate change at the same time, and taking that holistic approach to investment in our country. 
These plans reflected the spirit of previous EU investments. It was about projects that were aligned to national priorities and that were of strategic importance to our country. Projects such as Edinburgh University Centre for Regenerative uh, Medicine or Scottish, Scottish Canals Falkirk Wheel or the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations Moving On Project, and I think we have all seen their submission sent to us yeah. for uh, this debate, which said that some employability programmes and other programmes the SEVO have been involved in delivering are at risk because of the procrastination uh, and delay from the UK Government over the successive uh, funding uh, as well. Minister, if you conclude, please. So, as I turn to just winding up, uh, presenting officer, as a matter of democratic principle, members in this chamber must agree that the Scottish Parliament cannot allow the UK Government to infringe upon our devolved autonomy. And they must deliver on their pledges to the people of Scotland. We would not lose out because of Brexit, and the EU funding would be matched by the UK Government. We have to see these two commitments delivered in the near future, and this Government must be treated as an equal partner by the UK Government. Thank you. Thank you.